The Festival of Live Art is an inaugural festival that brings together live art practitioners from all across Australia and also internationally over a three-week season. Um, we've got a week here at Arts House and we've filled pretty much every nook and cranny of the building, both at North Melbourne Town Hall and at the Meat Market, with a huge array of quite extraordinary and very different activities that um, are an invitation to an audience to come and engage. Live art is probably one of the most disputed uh, classifications currently in the kind of Australian contemporary art scene and indeed internationally. I think it's less of a classification and more of a strategy. I think it's a, a way of artists uh, using their practice, using many different kinds of practices to engage with an audience and to open up questions about the form, about what it is to make a performance, what role they have as authors of that, as shapers of that experience, but also really critically, what is it that the audience bring to that? And really, I think what is common to all of these very different activities that are happening over the next few days is that the audience is absolutely critical to every single one of them. And without their willingness and their, sometimes their unwillingness, um, the experience is not complete. Here at, at Arts House, we've got some quite diverse scale and textures of performance. So probably the biggest work is, definitely the biggest work, is Game Show by Tristan Meacham and Aphids, which involves, I think, 150 participants in the work. It's based on the idea of uh, TV game shows. So he's using that genre to create an experience that really is very attractive and funny and engaging with audiences. But what he's kind of interjected into that structure is both literally his own possessions are, the, are what's up for grabs. So he's cleared out his house and he's put it all on stage. So every single object that he owns is potentially um, can be won by one of the participants. He's also interspersed through the game show concept some documentation of actually um, producers that produce real game shows on TV. So as you're watching it, you're also having the experience kind of deconstructed before you. And at the same time, he's interviewed his mum and dad who talk about him as a, as a person and as a, as a young artist, as, a, you know, as an exhibitionist in some way. So there are many layers going on within what is an extremely spectacular show because he's got as I say, 150 participants, a, a full choir, um, an amazing dance um, troupe, and a, a, a whole mock-up of a TV studio. So it's, it's a, really this fabulous kind of investigation into the spectacle, and it's sed seductive in that way, but it's also, um, he's really under, underpinning it and, and uh, investigating it. A filibuster of dreams is a performance that takes place from 11 p.m. till 9 a.m. on the main stage in the North Melbourne Town Hall at Arts House. So what happens is at 11 p.m. a dance party finishes and um, there's no transition, it just goes straight into a filibuster of dreams which starts with the choreography and me talking on stage. And I'll start talking at 11 and I'll finish at 9, I'll talk throughout that time and it will be a series of um, well wishes and dedications and toasts of gratitude. So it kind of mixes this idea up between this idea of, I guess, a, a filibuster from um, an American political stance of extending time and consuming time. And so I'm consuming time with toasts and I am basically trying to fill the hours, which are kind of, you know, known as like those dead hours in the middle of the night. Whether or not people believe in it, it's when I guess ideas of doubts and superstitions come into play. So I'm kind of passing that time with unconditional positive um, acts of gratitude, which is a very kind of Buddhist notion. Um, even, if, even if it's terrible, um, I'm grateful for it. So I'm interested in the idea of gratitude uh, because I think it's very, it's very difficult in this day and age. It's all too easy to be cynical. And so the hardest thing I feel in myself is to give thanks and appreciate what is around me. I'm not a Buddhist, I'm, I'm actually just a cynic. <laughs> and so um, it almost goes against the grain of everything I kind of respond to in my life. So it's a kind of, it's a real task for me, I guess, in um, reassessing. It also addresses this idea of meditation in practice. So maybe that 
connects to the idea of endurance, but the idea of endurance and gratitude is connected to this idea of failure um, and time in, in ideas of life performance. So my continuous gratitude, my, my continuous toasting, my, un, my unwavering hope throughout the nine hours um, will be at my own expense, but I'm doing it for my audience. And so it's this idea of, of giving and failing at the same time, or this idea of, um, I guess, filibusters have this real notion of being heroic and this kind of last stand before the fall, which, and usually filibusters don't, aren't, aren't passed anyway, they're just like a stalling mechanism. So I'm kind of playing off that notion, but purely in the sense of what it means to stand in front of an audience, especially if the audience isn't present. So it will be streamed and people will be there, but people are more than welcome to come and go. It's not a theatre show, like it's not, there's no real, well there will be a narrative arc of me being relatively awake and then perhaps exhausted by the end of it. Perhaps I'll fall asleep halfway through. But it is about tracking that relationship between myself as a performer and the audience within that time. Appropriately, the last hour is um, a toast to the white middle class artist um, creating performances in the dead of night for absolutely no one, for no political gains or social gains, actually for no real value other than their own kind of sense of self. And so um, that includes me and a, a list of all my peers that inspire my work. Uh, the work title is Nothing to See Here Dispersal. It's a choreography based on the sort of techniques that police and other administrative uh, people would use to clear away protesters and other people from public spaces. It's about sort of the general policing of public space and we're making it in collaboration with uh, the choreographer and dramaturg Ashley Dyer. So when the audience enters uh, the venue, basically they'll encounter uh, 20 people dressed as sort of police or security guards, kind of like it's, it's sort of ambiguous as what their status is, but people who have some sort of authority, they're all wearing kind of matching uniforms and they'll, uh, the audience will basically be constantly divided into different groups. They'll be manoeuvred and guided through the space. They'll be given different types of tasks, um, which will mostly be kind of bullshit, bureaucratic kind of boring tasks and then as as the show escalates there will be a more kind of choreographic movement where lines of of performers will go through the audience and and basically gather them up and uh, put them in a sort of kettle situation for the final image. One of the inspirations for the work is um, a text by the French philosopher Jacques Rancière where he talks about uh, what the police does in society and the police for Rancière doesn't just mean kind of cops. It's sort of general uh, sort of policing functions that sort of determine um, what's, what, possible. what's possible, what can be seen where, all yeah. that sort of thing. Um, and he says that what the police do, they don't just repress us, um, they also uh, can disperse us, they circulate us around, and if there's some sort of political rupture happening, they deny that it's happening. They, so the kind of the police line is, move on, there's nothing to see here, you know, there's no anything to be worried about. Um, there's no kerfuffle about the East-West Link, there's no kerfuffle about refugees, it's just, you know, it's just move on, there's nothing to see. Yeah. Um, so that was one inspiration for the work. Yeah, I think also the other inspiration, which is quite timely at the moment, is that um, Victoria has just introduced new laws to move on protesters, so it just gives the police more powers than ever to be able to determine what is le a, a legitimate protest and whether they think it's a disruption to public space and needs to, to be cleared away. So it's, it has a particular timely moment as well. The after effect of the work, I think, is going to be interesting because the, the audience is probably going to be frustrated and their, their experience in the show is constantly denying them a show and, and, um, and, and defying their desire to assemble to see a show. So we'll be constantly dividing them, ejecting, from the spa ejecting them from the space. I think we're planning to start with an audience of 75 and we'll end with an audience of 10. And so only 10 will see the end of the show. Um, so yeah, it's, it's an interesting experiment, but as a live art thing, uh, I, think, I think it's interesting to challenge audiences rather than just make them feel comfortable and, and happy and entertained. <laughs>
The Gold Coin series is a fourfold work at the moment. One is really a discussion about how I survive as an artist and using other means to try to produce my economy. Two, it's using the one dollar coin, which is an a easily known um, item and a sense of value for people, that the discussions are really based on something that we know and we can adhere to what even the value of a dollar is. Thirdly, it's um, to create a space for the public to have these discussions. So there's a lot of objects in the room that are acting like symbolic uh, trade items that artists would make and how we can kind of use them to discuss about how value is in, created in the moment, what are the intrinsic values, what's the ideas of future worth of, of um, objects, and then also how, you know, in a sense of trade, there's this idea that we're all kind of always sort of future propositions about the idea of objects. So one of the works in the Gold Coin series is called Just for the Thrill of It, and it's a 1970s leisure industry skill tester machine that I've reworked as an open business model. People pay a dollar to play, and inside are key tags, and these key tags are actually shares in the company. So if you win, you get a numbered key tag, you get an email address, and you send it to me. And the intention behind the work is to actually um, try and produce an open business model that people can be included in, artists, and then we form a kind of a collective, in a sense, around the work and see if it can kind of be self-generating. So I'm looking for ways to produce other incomes that are situated around an artwork but are not so forthright about the idea that you would have this idea that you produce work always for the future of selling. I'm kind of interested in the immediacy of econ economics. In the Gold Coin series shop, the audiences are engaged in dealing with the objects that I've collected of, and each of these objects I've bought cost one dollar, and I've got their receipts from when I go to the shop, which I'm re recalling here, their certificates of currency. So because they've moved into this location, as with any artwork, there's an intrinsic revaluing that takes place. I've got all my loadings of uh, transport, cost, storage, layout, people cleaning, all that sort of organisational aspects, and that inf infers that the price of an artwork increases just by the nature of um, it being itself. And I'm very in in uh, curious about how artworks are valued in that moment with people. So um, they're symbolic in their gesture by being here. They're not interesting for the majority of works. But the idea is that we, I start to be, use them as an ability to have discussions with people, but they're also for sale and people do buy them.